first to the important thing. Fun, joy, celebration, dreams. So, a theme song. fun stuff. Let's get down to business. I'm definitely feeling this extrapolative tension, this tension to extrapolate. And that happened because I've been getting some synchronistic emails in my inbox. And I'm sure all of us have experienced this, but it's nice to have these subtle synchronicities from the universe, these subtle messages. In disguise of benign emails from people that I'm on their mailing list. And today I was listening to something because I got an email from Dabney Alex and I'm on her mailing list as she was the woman who organized the Shades of Awakening Summit, online summit on mental health in 2015. And I listened to all of it and it was really good. And I did talk to her once on the phone. And I wanted to utilize some of her services to try and start something. But then I ended up in the hospital and then that was my really bad hospitalization. So anyways, I didn't. But I read her email. And before I get into that, because I'm really, really not into linear logical order at all, I just want to share that... I was editing my last video and I talked a lot about reaching my dream of being back in California. And I didn't even mention, because I'm that forgetful, that I reached my hugest dream of all, which is to be medication free. And to be even more nonlinear, two weeks today, I will be home from California. Because I'm taking the train, so it'll take about two days on the train. So two weeks from now today, I will be waking up at home. And so yeah, the biggest dream was really to taper off these meds, and I've been able to accomplish that. And I think that I feel a lot of the changes. And I could talk about the changes, and I have along the way, but perhaps just going through this year, it's easier to see the changes. And... Maybe now that I'm off the meds, it's going to be easier to be the change that I wish to be, as Gandhi might say. And so the messages I've been getting to my inbox are interesting because they're all about sort of speaking up. And Dabney shared that she listened to this TED Radio Hour about speaking up. And so I read her article and how the first woman in that podcast, she speaks up about being queer in a country where... Basically, you could be tortured for that. And so it's just interesting because at some point I will want to share. And I'm seeing that maybe I'll want to unfold some of this movement towards sharing because it is challenging and I could actually go out there and get someone to help me figure out what to share, what not to share, when to share, why to share, why not to share, etc., etc. Or... I could just really unfold that for myself, which is something I've been doing all along. It's just unfolding things for myself and and moving into that understanding. Yet at the same time, we're all connected, so people send messages to each other and whatever's salient, we can pick up on. So I got a bunch of emails in my inbox, but the ones that were salient, like this one about speaking up, 
are more messages for me in what I'm moving towards understanding right now. And so Dabney included in her email a quote from Martin Luther King saying, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. And I've been framing this all along as something for myself and, and it is. Yet at the same time, I am really hoping that it's something that I can share or share some of it to, to point to something and I'm not really sure what that is. Maybe it's just speaking up to oneself for oneself and listening to oneself and not really saying, oh, I need to speak up to others. So this is where I get a little confused because in certain states I've seen everything as one and connected. So if I'm able to do this for myself, whatever this is, then maybe it will help others. And maybe by capturing it in this way, it will be more helpful to others. So I'm doing this for myself, but I'm capturing it also hoping to share it at some point, and there's many reasons I haven't shared it yet. Partly because I know once I share it, it, I don't even want to finish that sentence, I don't even know yet. But the point is that I don't want to stay silent, and this is a way to definitely not be silent, and actually amplify the non-silence by putting a lot on video and really kind of experimenting with myself and collecting a lot of evidence for myself about this process of self-dialogue and how that unfolding meaning for oneself can unfold a meaningful life. And so one reason I'm not sharing right now is I'm not back home, I'm not settled, and I can't really do anything that could be really stressful while I'm in another country. That wouldn't be good. So we'll see. I will know when it's the right time to share, but I still feel like unfolding some of the meaning around sharing as time goes on. And after reading her email and then listening to that TED radio hour, I just have so much to extrapolate. So I really feel this tension to extrapolate right now, even though I've been rollerblading in my dreams and my legs have been feeling a little bit restless, like I need to do some kind of physical activity but I do want to just talk about some of this stuff because it's there and it's fresh and I do have a lot and I might just wait to edit some of these and just talk to myself on video and edit some of them on the train and just listen to myself unfold some of this and I won't do that many videos but today I'll do a few. So she talks about some mindset shifts to help us face self-doubt and saying, your work is not about you. It was given to you as a vision by spirit and your job is to be an open, curious, and committed steward of your calling. And I feel like this self-dialogue has become my calling. I've made it into my calling by doing it. And I've talked about how we learn to walk by walking. We don't yet know how to walk, but somehow we walk and then we learn. So this is sort of my walking and learning and I sort of realize more today, and I talk about this a lot with myself, that it's one thing to speak as and speak and unfold understanding, but it's another thing to actually move as that, to actually get up and make gestures that are congruent with the understanding that one has unfolded for oneself. And the trouble is in map consciousness, when we first get that powerful energy burst of so-called mania, is that we're trying to understand at the same time as the energy is moving us to behave or perform new gestures. And this is related to something that I learned in this TED Radio Hour. There was a man named Adam Galinsky on the TED Radio Hour, and he's some kind of social scientist. And what he said really expanded my mind. And things, when people say things and they expand my mind, it's usually expanding my own understanding of the framework I'm creating, but what they're saying fits into it somehow because everybody's something fits into something somehow, I see. So it always can provide a lot of inspiration for extrapolation and building more of this understanding I'm creating for myself. And he talks about the range of acceptable behavior and how 
the more power we have, the more range of acceptable behavior we have. And I won't go into that exactly right now, but to me, that state of mania feels very, very powerful. And so it's no wonder that all of a sudden we're experiencing way more of a range of behaviors that we're capable of doing. And in that state, they all feel acceptable to us to some extent. And it's almost like we've done so many behaviors and gestures and and movements in the moment and responding to the moment so quickly in such a powerful way in such a short period of time that we then start at some point to retract by thinking this isn't acceptable and that's sort of coupled with scary things so unacceptable thoughts so that's really complex I don't really want to get into that because I can see a lot more just even when I say that and that's not the direction I wanted to go but I usually don't really correct the direction I go but I'm trying to stay somewhat concise because I don't have a lot of time in these next couple weeks to talk about this stuff and I want to get to the part that really was intriguing for me so I'll talk about how the acceptable behavior gestures and everything feeling powerful and acceptable as it retracts everything feels unacceptable and that is coupled with all these unacceptable thoughts and then when those unacceptable thoughts come in they could lead to so-called unacceptable behaviors which actually could be sort of unacceptable they could be bad but really it's fed by the unacceptable thoughts which are programmed into us through society like that's not an acceptable behavior that's unacceptable I still feel there's something much more beyond this whole thought of acceptable and non-acceptable behavior. That's still putting a dualistic framework of ego retrospection on what we're doing. It's a different, it's a correction and it's still a different movement than what I would say, but it's still fascinating to hear what Adam Galinsky had to say. And then Dabney Alex said in her email, I'm definitely going to jump around a lot because this isn't about linear logic it's about extrapolation and seeing and it's infinite so it doesn't really matter going from one bit to another and she said your work is not about you it's about all those who stand to benefit heal and grow when you get out of your own way and fully step into your power and learn to express your message fully and I feel like I feel like I want to express my message fully before I put it out there and I'm doing that by unfolding it with myself but there's definitely something that I would like to share at some point. So part of the reason I frame it about just me talking to myself and if anyone just listens, it's just, okay, you're passively listening to me talking to myself. I'm not trying to help with anything. I'm not trying to do anything. And I'm not. What I'm talking about has... This framework of either it's a mental illness, it's a medical problem, and I've had that label put on me, so I'm speaking from my experience and speaking myself through that experience of being labeled and then hopefully out the other side. But I'm not a doctor, so I can't give advice on a medical problem, but I can share my experience of being labeled with a medical problem when. I feel and have shared and unfolded and extrapolated for myself thousands of different bits of meaning other than that. So it's actually sharing a movement away from just a pathologizing perspective, which I can share from my own experience why I feel it's not that. But I can't say, well, if it is that, you can do this to help yourself and that to help yourself and blah, blah, blah. And that's why I say, well, maybe it's not that. It's just a nutrient dependency. So now I'm supporting my nutrient dependency with micronutrients. So that's one of the reasons that I framed it that way. And I've also framed it that way because I'm talking myself into the reality of it being true. So just a month or so ago, I was still on the meds. So I would still have some belief in that paradigm in that I'm still participating in it by taking its therapies and treatments. But now that I'm outside of that, it's a different story. And that's why I was almost thinking at some point I might just 
put this bit together and then start a completely new thing without any reference to that and maybe not share the whole mental health bit or maybe I will. I really don't know what I'm going to do but I just feel like my brain is starting to integrate something and wants to share at a different perspective. I don't really know what that's all about but this theme of sharing is coming up and and it also came into play because Adam Galinsky talks about when you share something, if it's advocating for others or it's to help others, it's more powerful. So this is kind of paradoxical for me because I'm saying, I'm not trying to help others, I'm just talking to myself. But maybe just talking to myself does help others because nobody likes to be told what to do. Nobody really likes to be helped in ways that aren't helpful. And that's kind of part of the point too, is that when a person like me, I've been labeled with a mental illness, there's been many helpful things, but then there's also many unhelpful things that are just put on me. And then there's things that are helpful because there's no other forms of help. There's no other alternatives or options. There's no less invasive possibilities. So then the help is there as help, but it's it's maybe an invasive form of health and that it's destroying my internal organs and and just toxic on so many levels. So... I really am spending hours a day doing this not just for myself but for other people and just framing it in a way that really it's about finding our own inner guide and helper and and learning from our own being and understanding and when we understand something our nervous system is able to make that part of reality salient for us. When we're only understanding according to our thought programs, we're always going to be moving in the salience of that. And it could be helpful for some period of time, just like taking medications can be helpful for a period of time. But the longer it goes on, it actually becomes detrimental. So if I stay on lithium for 20, 30 years, it's going to destroy my kidneys. So at some point, even if it is limitedly helpful, it becomes harmful. And so, really, that's the part I'm trying to balance and have moved myself out of. So just with these messages coming to me about speaking up, like Dabney Alex sending that, and that sort of being a question in my mind, when to speak up or how, and then the... TED Radio Hour was really cool to listen to and I only listened to half because when I did get to the part about what Adam Galinsky was sharing it was very fascinating to my brain. So it is nice to get special messages from the universe in a very benign form in terms of those emails to one's mailbox and what really makes them special messages is our own understanding. and. If we're not moving in our own understanding, our attention is on all these programs in our brain and that's going to direct our attention on something else that maybe isn't that meaningful but we've been programmed to make salient. So by unfolding our own meaning, we can actually make what is meaningful to us salient and available to us in reality and we're not going to miss it. So in a way, synchronicity is not missing anything meaningful. It's moving from meaning to meaning to meaning to meaning. But in that really powerful state, it's almost like too much meaning. It's almost like being eventually in some kind of disordered state because there's too much meaning. So then we actually fall out of that and then possibly get medicated and numbed out and then there's no meaning. So when we start again from that place of no meaning, can we still slowly unfold and find meaning? And even when you think about taking something like a psychotropic drug, it makes everything seem meaningful and connected and interesting and beautiful. We can do that for ourselves on a daily basis. We don't need to take something to get that state. And taking something to get that state could be useful to some limited extent, but it's then up to us to really keep going with that. We can do that with our own eyes and our own perception and our own brains and hearts. And I was talking about power with that 
Martin quote that I read in the last video, and I'll go on to that in the next video. This is why when I read stuff of other people, my brain, when it finds something fascinating, just extrapolates to the max. And I'm okay with that because this is interesting, but at the same time, it definitely creates this sort of tension within myself to speak up, to speak as my extrapolation of what I just understood. So I'll probably just leave these videos to edit on the train. And I don't even remember if I said that. Another email I got was from the Mindfulness Summit and it was about the head heart gut check-in. And they sent a little infographic just showing you can do a quick check-in and just sort of breathe and then bring your awareness to your head and acknowledge your thoughts in relationship to the present situation and then drop down your awareness to your heart and attend to your values of the situation, what you care about, your deepest intention, and then drop down to the gut and tune into your hunches, intuitions, and emotions about the current situation. And then the last one is collect all this information, take a deep breath in and have a sense of collecting all the information from the body and the mind and ask yourself, what shall I do now? And listen for the answers. And I found this fascinating from the Mindfulness Summit because that to me is sort of a breakdown of what happens somewhat when we're in map consciousness. We're not just going based on our rational intellectual thinking. We're getting sources of information from our heart, our brain, our gut, our, all our senses at the same time. And it's hard to actually make sense of it. And they say this is a 30 second process. I feel like it can happen instantaneously. And the art of it is really being in alignment with all that information moment to moment, not walking around based on thought programs and intellectualization about things and then having to sit down and figure it out. But we can actually close the gap of that and understand how to do that instantaneously. And that's in a way perhaps what insight is. It's having all of those fully attuned so then it just is a flash of understanding, not having to like sit and kind of listen. If we're able to listen all the time, if our mind is quiet, then we don't have to like sit and listen in opposition and resistance to all the noise to try and get a sense of something we really want. Because the programs are telling us what we've been programmed to want and desire and to think about and to make salient, but it's just a bunch of past programming. So, in map consciousness, we get in tune with so much more information and it's mixed in with all the old programming. So our programming might be saying, do this, but then the intuition and the this other intelligence, this other dimension is making us do all sorts of things. And then we think, oh, why well, out of control. There's no control. It's just a different operating system of control, which isn't really control. It's just being fluidly moved by the moment. When we can do that, there's no need to control anything. Just really observe and be aware and be silent so that calculation of all of the senses together can operate. Not having this information flowing through and, oh, I think of this and I think of that and I should do this and I shouldn't do that. Too late, we've missed the moment. And the other interesting email I got was from Catherine Wilking. And she's sort of a balance feng shui type coach, I think. I've never worked with her, but her email was fame and reputation, time to stand up and be recognized. And so I got this email the same morning that I got the one about speaking up. And she wrote an article and she defines fame as being recognized for something. And she says that fame is part of the nine areas of life. And is there a need to draw attention to ourselves? Blah, blah, blah. And she says, you may observe someone having a fire moment, a person who will stand up for a cause or execute drama for change and more. And she talks about 
Standing up for yourself doesn't mean that you'll go down in history as the world's biggest bully, but it means you can handle 15 minutes of fame speaking up for a cause. So I've definitely done a lot more than 15 minutes of speaking, and I hope this is standing up for myself and it's standing up for other people who go through these things. And speaking up for people who have lost all their power and... I'll go into this power thing next. I just wanted to talk about these few things before going into what Adam Galinsky was saying. As long as your actions are from clear intentions in your heart, you too can help change this world. Ask questions, find your voice, show everyone your fire element. So the universe is saying speak up, just like that animal medicine card spread with the badger. This me talking to myself for hours upon hours is really a form of badgery. It's like badgering the point, and the point is there is no point, but to just speak up in one's own voice for oneself. And and this is helping my own understanding, and really if there's anything I hope is that people will see that we can understand for ourselves and ignite the fire of self-understanding. And moving in that field of self-understanding and making meaning for oneself. Even if it starts out kind of out there, it can be brought into harmony. But only through ourselves, not by looking for the meanings other people give us. Whether it's medical or any kind of meaning, we still have to make our own. And make our own understanding, which could be the same as meaning. Understanding makes it sound like it's more correct. Meaning could be any kind of meaning, but in a way, they're both quite the same. And it also says to display one's achievements in a room, in a house, or something like that. So maybe when I go home, I'll actually look at some of those things that I've been trying to do. I don't know why, but this talking to myself about speaking up is kind of convincing myself to do so at some point. And I will for sure. I just don't know which part and how much and blah, blah, blah. I just don't know. And and I also watched something really incredible. It's called 1950s Housewife on LSD, and it's on YouTube. And I'm not saying this to promote LSD. I've never done LSD myself. My brain goes into altered states without any help the universe is my LSD. Anytime there's some kind of thing developed by humanity to initiate a process in the human brain, we can do that ourselves. The body can make internal LSD or an analog to LSD, or LSD is an analog to some other process in the body. So I'm more interested in that and actually staying away from things that would put me in extreme states. And I feel like unfolding understanding for oneself is a way to stepwise get to a place where we're so perceptive. We're just as perceptive and sensitive and seeing meaning and insightful as we would be on LSD. But we don't even feel like we're on LSD. We just feel how we are. So then it becomes so embodied because we don't have to be in an extreme state. It's more like the state is embodied in all the neurology so it's not a state it's just how we are so I was just struck by how she speaks she says she can see the oxygen molecules I really recommend watching it for anyone who's gone into so-called mania and psychosis because to me it feels like if somebody were to approach us if we're in mania and they asked us what is it like like what are you experiencing is it good is it bad we might say things like she's saying. We might say, can you see this? Can you see? We're speaking as what we're seeing in the moment. And it's interesting because I already talked about this in a previous video, how when we're in that state and just out in the general public, we're like, can you see the leaf? Or wow, and talking to people and asking them about them and look at that, that's so magical. We're not saying, oh, when I was two, this happened and blah, 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 and how we usually relate. Or did you watch this show last night? We're really in the moment and trying to share the moment with somebody. And we can see it, it's so obvious we're so with that, but everyone else is kind of like, some people seem like they're there sometimes, but they're not. And then eventually that, I can see more, can you see it too? 
is turned into, I can see things, I'm seeing things, I'm hallucinating, blah, blah, blah. So by not being able to share that moment with people, eventually we have to share a moment with a psychiatrist saying, I'm seeing things. When originally it was, I'm seeing more. Can you see this leaf? Can you see this beauty? But then it's the psychiatrist asking us, are you seeing things, blah, blah, blah. When we were all along trying to say, yes, I am seeing things. Do you see this leaf? Do you see how magical this flower is? Do you see how beautiful it smells? And everyone's like, da, 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 walking around in their own programs that have nothing to do with the moment. So we're trying to invite people into the moment, but then we get invited back into the ego programming by psychiatry and the medical paradigm. But anyways, if we were in mania, so-called mania, and a researcher came up and were asking us questions, kind of like in this 1950s housewife LSD video, we might say kind of similar things that she's saying, like, it's all one, and... And she was saying, can you see the air? And, oh my gosh, it just passed through me. <gasps> oh my gosh. And then she said something about, um, he asked something about, oh, is it pleasurable? Is it non-pleasurable? She's like, why would I even think about it in terms of pleasure? It's just so beautiful. It's just like, I can't even say it. I can't even talk about it. She's like, I wish I could talk about it and show you, but you won't be able to see it. And then she's like, so I just feel sorry for you. So she's just really speaking as like how beautiful everything is and feeling sorry for the researcher. So if we were in that state of mania and with a psychiatrist and able to really speak as the moment without the ego stuff mixed in, because when she was being researched, she wasn't being asked about her ego. Like, how was your personality? It was expected that her personality was going to be different. So they weren't asking like, about that kind of stuff. They were actually allowing the personality to be suspended and just asking her questions. And and at one point he said something about her as a me and not even asking about the me, but she's like, me, like what's me? And it was just really fascinating to watch how she was just this 1950s housewife and she's really just speaking as beauty, speaking as seeing beauty and we can turn on this beauty sense in our nervous system and really see it. We don't really need exogenous biomolecules in order to do that. We've just been so programmed and conditioned that we can't see it. It's right there. So she takes something that removes the conditioning. It doesn't add anything. It takes something away. And so that's what this energy does that comes in in so-called mania is it's so powerful that it just blows apart the ego structure temporarily it's like it's and then eventually the gravity of it as society is all around us pushes it back into some semblance of structure and then the medication comes in and tries to help glue it all together but really it's removing or suspending or breaking that structure in order for us to just be able to see so they can do this with people by giving them LSD. But the universe can do it too. Our own bodies can do it too. We don't need to take something. So we can, but to me, this process is the same as the one the universe can invoke through the energy of the universe. And I feel like the energy of the universe is way more powerful than the human ego. And the ego doesn't stand a chance when that happens. But then all the egos of professionalism and everything, you know, like the Humpty Dumpty syndrome come back to glue the ego back together so we can function and get some meaningless job. So it's like reattaching and establishing oneself in meaninglessness. And that's what it's all about. So that extra energy comes in and we can see meaning and we can see the moment and we can see beauty and we're moving in a completely different different field. And by doing that, we have completely different behaviors, completely different gestures. And this leads into what Adam Galinsky was saying about speaking up. But I won't go into that quite yet. I was listening to that TED hour on speaking up and the first woman who was talking, she was sharing that it's her responsibility to normalize in her case, being queer in a country where it's not acceptable at all. And and it would be nice if she could speak up and not have to worry about dying. 
and I have that similar worry. But at the same time, I can't let that stop me. So the podcast was Ideas on Speaking Up. It was the TED Radio Hour, and it said something about what about when the whole world depends on my voice? And I know in map consciousness, I definitely felt at some points like the whole world depended on me. And that's called, after the fact, grandiosity by psychiatrists. But maybe there is an element of truth to that. Maybe my whole world depends on me speaking up, whatever that means. And it also was about ideas about what it takes and when you know it's time to say something. So it's interesting because I've been thinking about this for myself and here's a podcast about this very thing. What to say, when to say it, when it's time. So I'm wondering about that for sure. So I feel like the universe is sending me signs. It's not sending me signs as much as my understanding or what I'm wondering about at this time or inquiring into. I'm finding salient bits to help me unfold that understanding because it's not like I'm a separate thing from the universe. I'm in the universe. I'm of the universe. I'm with the universe. I'm I'm through the universe. I am in the universe. We all are. So the external isn't really external. And that was another thing that she said in the LSD video. She said, when he asked, when the scientist asked, how do you feel on the inside? She's like, inside? There is no inside. And it was just brilliant, really. It's quite a brilliant video. I'm very inspired by it. Not inspired to take LSD, but inspired to keep understanding and perceiving and speaking as perception so that maybe one day, I don't know, I don't even want to finish that sentence, but maybe one day we're just all friends sharing in the beauty of the moment and nobody's really having to ask what it's like because everybody is just abiding in that. I know what it's like to have that state turned into something that it's not. And this isn't my voice. This is just many voices speaking through me, many unheard voices. If we are all just abiding in perceiving beauty and acting on that and unfolding meaning and sharing together, I wouldn't have to be sitting here speaking about this stuff. It would be a different world and we'd be doing different things with our time. And the woman who was speaking up in that country where it wasn't okay to be queer she fears being tortured and things and and I was wondering if I fear that or if I speak up because I know many people are being psychologically tortured put on medications that make things worse and then told that it's just worsening of their illness which then just justifies nearly any means of treatment in the future and that's not okay And something that Adam Galinsky said, and I'll just skip a little bit ahead, was that there's factors involved in speaking up, in having sort of the confidence in a way to speak up. And one of them is if one doesn't have the expertise or the qualifications is to have a lot of evidence. And I don't have the expertise in terms of a medical framework. I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist or anything like that. So by not having those expertise in terms of intellectual study, I need to have a lot of evidence in terms of my own subjective experimentation, my own observations, my own study of myself and this process I've been moving through and with and as. So That's one of the reasons, if you want to call it a reason, that I will share when I have enough evidence. So I still don't have the evidence that this consciousness here in California translates back home. I kind of was thinking of it in terms of California consciousness and how can I have that California consciousness when I go back to Canada. I don't know if it translates, so I need to wait and see if there's evidence that it does translate. And how does it translate? And 
What do I want to look into next? And I need to stop this video now, but I will make another one. So hopefully I can do this extrapolation on what Adam Galinsky was talking about in just one more video. I've been alluding to it, but now I'm here. But one more thing is that the woman who was speaking up about being queer in a country where it's not okay was saying something about she has to speak up because there's an, an enormous sense of responsibility that would haunt her. And I actually feel in a way that so-called psychosis is this sense of enormous responsibility that haunts us. It's like feeling the whole responsibility of all of the human collective unconscious and it's haunting us all that whole collective unconscious. It's not my bad thoughts and your bad thoughts or whatever. It's part of the whole collective. And some of us get thrust into having access to that information. And it's very scary. Just like the information in so-called mania is very ecstatic and wonderful and beautiful and magical. What goes up must come down. But what goes up very slowly in an unfolding of understanding doesn't necessarily fall back down. We'll see. We'll see if unfolding one's understanding for oneself in self-dialogue is somewhat of an antidote to Humpty Dumpty syndrome. Falling down too quickly and breaking apart and then having the medical establishment trying to glue us back together when we could probably just put ourselves back together if we had enough time, space, love, and understanding. So anyways, so I do have the sense of this enormous responsibility. And when so-called mania and psychosis, that energy is back in my awareness, I'm aware of all these things that I'm responsible for directly and indirectly as being a member of the human world. And all of the world is within us to understand and we're all part of it and we're all co-creating it. So we're all responsible for it. And it does feel like an enormous sense of responsibility. Like in so-called mania, people might say, I'm God or I have to save the world or I have to do this or we're just very active. And then when that flips into so-called psychosis, we might say things like, I'm, I did all of this, I'm so bad, or fear like we might do something bad, or feel like we did something bad, not sure, but really, that's just part of all of the collective unconsciousness. All the infinite possibilities of so-called good, and then all the possibilities of so-called bad, but they're all related to the level of consciousness, so we all have access to all the levels of consciousness, and our ego keeps us in some kind of semblance of equilibrium, but really it's just ignoring everything that's happening in order to protect ourselves. And then when that breaks apart and we realize we're not a separate self, we're, we're all part of this, we're all responsible, we all could do something. We don't know. At first we try to do so much in so-called mania, and then when that sort of runs out of energy, we feel like, I did all this, I'm, I'm so bad, I'm responsible for it all. And, and that is actually quite lethal. So what it really does, though, is recalibrate our nervous system to see all potentialities and thus be more attuned to empathetically respond in the moment moving forward if we can survive the recalibration. And when we go into so-called recovery and just sort of try to glue our ego back together and and go on with life as it was, or usually a shadow of what it was, but still within that same self-preserving framework, we're sort of missing the point of what that energy was showing us, is that we're not separate, and, and we're here to, to do something, I don't know what, but by doing nothing, we're doing something. By just walking through life and Operating with that empathy, we are doing something, we're not doing nothing. 
and I feel like a lot of us get more attuned to empathy and then we're never able to really understand it so we're left on the outside we're left in the margins but really we can see a lot more than people who haven't been through those states so I'm digressing but anyways so I listened to Adam Galinsky's TED talk after hearing about him on the TED radio hour about speaking up and he talks about how there's a moral factor a social support and allies factor and an expertise factor in the decision to speak up and I feel like I'm just speaking up and when I do share this I might have some allies maybe not I don't know if I would be seen as having expertise I don't know if I do I'm not really wanting that I don't want expertise at all if I decide to be an expert in something that actually eliminates the capacity to perceive other things it creates sort of a tunnel vision and that's something I don't want so perhaps being an expert in not being an expert or being an expert at understanding and unfolding meaning for oneself whether or not other people see it that way it doesn't matter because if we're all trying to operate based on what we think other people are seeing it as then it's just confusion so if we can at least produce understanding for ourselves then it could actually eliminate confusion in the whole so this is where it gets interesting he talks about the range of acceptable behavior and how it expands and contracts based on the context it's not it's not a fixed thing so if I have a boss and I'm speaking with my boss, my range of acceptable behavior changes than if I'm hanging out with a child or with my boss I might not be able to speak up at all but with a child I might be able to be silly and goofy and say ridiculous things and just have fun but I couldn't act that way in front of my boss. So the range of acceptable behavior changes. And to me this is important in that it relates to what I've been talking about with how be aware of who we have in front of us. It's the same thing. If I'm sitting in a psychiatrist's office, my range of acceptable behavior is very limited. I have to sit there, answer the questions, as if I want to answer those questions, as if I want to be in that office. So I have to sort of play that role and that really limits my range of acceptable behavior. So if I'm always in clinical settings or mostly and then just go home by myself and watch TV, I'm going to be living a very narrow life in terms of the behaviors and gestures that's, that are going to create my life by virtue of the situations and the context and the people I'm putting in front of me. So I talked recently about how changing that, changing the people that are in front of us and that we can be open with is important to have some people like that. So I would say be around people that your range increases. And interestingly enough, in map consciousness, in so-called mania, one's range of acceptable behavior increases vastly to oneself without fear of reward or punishment. So it actually, what is really acceptable behavior? It's either being rewarded or punished for one's behavior. And that's duality. That's thinking about the programs of the social morality. And really map consciousness is getting us in touch with a different morality a morality of discovering morality for oneself not by going based on the influences of the programming and we'll still discover morality and it'll be different and more integrated because we'll have discovered it for ourselves and it's a different morality even in say we're in in so-called mania we're feeling so magical and powerful and then all of a sudden we make it a part of our ego and we want to get rich because of it. All of a sudden we find ourselves in so-called psychosis. It's because we tried to put the social morality of success and goals and making a lot of money at the expense of other people into the living morality of, of the moment. Putting a goal and a motive into it, which is projecting the future from the past and that's just an example that's not all of it that's just a very small example and I'm not saying everyone that wants to make money just wants to be rich for themselves but it's just once we sort of feel powerful and then we think in terms of the old programming that money is power and then we want to use that power to get money 
that's going to weaken the nervous system according to this living morality that it's building. So it pulls us down and says, no, you're not. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves in so-called psychosis and medicalized and on drugs from the psychiatric system. And the point of that is not to say, oh, well, just keep doing that forever. Just keep taking the pills. Just keep being a medical patient. It's begin again and, and learn again from the beginning. It's a game. Like to learn this way of being and operating is a game. It's a different game. And just because we fall off our bike as a five-year-old doesn't mean we never get back on and try again. Why wouldn't we jump back on the bike of our own human nervous system in our own life, in our own game? This is our life. And we don't jump back on the bike. So interestingly enough, I think part of what is missing in what Adam Galinsky is saying from my own perspective is that these programs of reward and punishment are what block power. And he talks about power. He says, your power determines your range. So in the example of being with a child, I have more power over the child by virtue of being an adult. So I can kind of do anything. I can yell at the child or I can play with the child or anything. So in myself, I might feel like there's a lot of acceptable behaviors around the child, yet I have more power over the child, so if they act a certain way, I will punish them and limit their range of acceptable behaviors. And in this way, I teach them their acceptable range of behaviors, and they carry that with them. We condition them with this power structure. And in so-called mania, it's a huge surge in power. So we get a huge range of acceptable behaviors. And what happens is we move in that energy of feeling like all these behaviors are acceptable. From our perspective, society over time, through how they respond to us, are like, that's not acceptable, that's not acceptable, that's not acceptable. Until we've just basically shriveled up into not being able to do anything. And part of the reason why at some point it gets to a scary point of not being able to do anything or running in fear is because we realize we're being recaptured into the social order of responding based on social programs of what is acceptable and not acceptable, reward and punishment. So the power of so-called mania, that energy, moves us beyond reward and punishment but the longer we move in that field, eventually we are again susceptible to the order of reward and punishment. And it feels like a punishment to be losing that state beyond reward and punishment. And so we actually can run in fear and then and then it's actually mirrored in reality where like the police are chasing us or our families are dragging us into the psych ward or we're arrested and taken into the psych ward. It's just sort of an outer manifestation of falling out of that feeling of freedom from operating outside of reward and punishment and really reward and punishment is embedded in our nervous system it's what stops us from just acting instead of acting I sort of think first oh is this going to be bad or good or am I going to get something good or bad or but in that field of of magic we're just moving fluidly and sort of learning as we go and then the trouble is the longer we're in that, we sort of learn as we go that it's not okay to be like that. It's not okay to be that dynamic, that fluid, that free. And we can sort of be that way for a while, but at some point, something as simple as a family member saying, you're not yourself, is like, well, who am I? Who do you think I am? Like, am I who you programmed me to be or the whole world programmed me to be? I don't think that's really who we are. And if we even just look at that, 1950s housewife video on YouTube of her on LSD which one is her the one of her on LSD or the one of her being told by the by the researcher oh you're normal according to tests normal and dull and boring and whatever but so we get this huge surge in power and then eventually the gravity of the social structure which is everywhere except that field of energy that we're able to move in for a certain period of time sort of 
again just closes in on us and recaptures us in the bubble of society and then puts us on meds and is like it's not okay to be that way just take your meds for the rest of your life and you'll be fine you won't be that way the mind is trying to free itself from itself the mind is trying to free itself of these social programs so what Adam Galinsky is talking about is still within the realm of social programs but it's still valuable to sort of understand some of these mechanisms especially for people who move into states that move their being into operating beyond social programs to have an awareness of how they operate it can actually be a compass it can be a guide it's sort of like having a better map than the next person because one can see from a different vantage point it doesn't make the other map completely obsolete but it's like having different information just a more vast map and the more that we understand the structure and this mechanism the more we can see it in operation it might not change what the mechanism eventually does we might still get captured by society every time but at least we won't be as afraid we, we will know oh at some point I'll be able to start again and that state and that energy and that perception is so much more powerful that once one has operated in that way a few times it's easy to get back it's kind of like just being able to just go into that state without having to really really try it's just like if we learn to walk as a child and then we have an injury and we can't walk for a year we're going to be able to walk we still remember how it just might take a little while for the muscles to get some strength we still have that pattern within ourselves of of understanding how to do that and in the brain so these tracks and patterns and blueprints and maps still get laid down in the brain so it's never a waste it's never a failure it's just learning to live in that energy again and being able to expand our range of acceptable behaviors for maybe a longer period of time in that energy and so many people crave that state of mania because it does expand our range of acceptable behavior. We become more creative. We actually create our behavior as we go. It's not like we just add 10 gestures that we can do. We add a gesture in a moment of an action that we never even knew we had. And we see we have capacities of range of movement and motion and dynamism and expression that we just never knew we're there and we only know we're there by having that power and then the moment inviting that out so the way society is designed right now the moments don't invite that out but when that energy comes in it just brings it out but then eventually the momentum of society just kind of squashes that at some point but it provides somewhat of a blueprint for how to move about and maybe slowly expand the range of acceptable behaviors and this to me is related to harvest practice and body harvest that expanded range of acceptable behaviors that were acceptable to us when we were in that state where we felt powerful and beautiful and in alignment with our true selves but others couldn't see that but having an awareness of that we can then practice that and slowly expand those instead of just waiting for the state and the energy to bring it back and just sort of kamikazeing out with our gestures until we land again in the psych ward and get even more chemicalized until oh your condition's getting worse it's not that way it's not a linear thing it's not a time thing it's something that we accessed and we can get back to but we can actually unfold it and in time and embed it more in our neurology by participating with that understanding of the expanded ranges of acceptable behaviors and then Adam Galinsky talked about something really interesting he talked about the low power double bind which is something along the lines of when we have low power if we don't speak up because we have low power we don't really get noticed or we don't really get our needs met but if we do speak up we'll probably get punished and I feel like all people who get labeled and pathologized are in a low power double bind. Pretty much every situation we're in, we don't have the power to speak up. But if we ever do muster it, 
it's misinterpreted, we get punished. So if I share that I'm having some interesting perceptions, I'll just get more medication because of the fact that I'm in a relationship that is a very extreme power differential. When really these interesting perceptions are a sign of power and then the power over me of the psychiatrist gives me something to take away that power. And he also gives the example of gender differences and how we think and how really the whole thing that happens with gender differences isn't a gender thing specifically but the fact that women don't have as much power as men and that's really fascinating to me too and that's why with that situation a little while ago where I felt sort of powerful telling somebody to just get out I felt like I did have more power in that moment and so I feel it's really important to not do anything that would take my power away in terms of the power in my nervous system, the power of expression, the power of perception and expression. So I actually feel like self-dialogue is a way to eventually overcome this low power double bind because one starts to feel more powerful in oneself and not in terms of power over others but just being able to powerfully speak one's truth and and then not fear the punishment because also one is able to be more aware of when to say things to who and stuff like that. So the things that I say to myself, I just say to myself. But then sometimes the context and, and communication I've created for myself actually does trickle out into my daily life. And it is more and more over time. So it's a way to to build the power of my own communication in my nervous system so then when the moment does call for it, it can arise because I've already created created it for myself. And this could seem somewhat contrived, but really it's trying to overcome the gravity of all of the history of hundreds of years of psychiatry and what that would want to do to me and then make money off of me for that. and. So this really is a way to sort of withstand some of that gravity and vortex energy trying to pull me back into that. And even if I do get pulled back into it, I'll know that I can get myself out of it again because it's a very powerful vortex. And what else is going to move me away from that but my own understanding, my own perceptions, giving voice to my own insights about this and it looks like I have one more video to make. In a way, after one has been in mania, which is having access to the power of the universe moving through the human nervous system instead of just the low power voltage of ego thought programs running through the human nervous system, then one has had one's power taken away from the universe and when that happens, a lot of times we're, we're rendered non-functional. So it can almost feel like reward and punishment from the universe. But it's not actually reward and punishment, it's just learning. We're all learning and that's why I think self-dialogue is important to just continue to learn. Any way to just continue to learn could be useful, whether it's self-dialogue or any way that one is able to learn with oneself, for oneself, and unfold understanding. Maybe it's just in talking to other people. It could look very different for different people. But if we're always learning and understanding, then that is the reward, and there's no punishment in that. But there might be some learning that feels like punishment. So this whole idea of a low-power double-bind in terms of being labeled isn't necessarily a double bind but it's low power so we have low power and so how to raise the power in our nervous system is one thing and one of the powers is actually communication 
So when we're in that high state of so-called mania, we're communicating a lot, we're receiving a lot of information and communication, and we're trying to move that communication to our nervous system, and we're not able to do that, and eventually it sort of shuts off that communication, and all these ego programs flood back in, and then we're totally in chaos, and then we're captured and pathologized in some way. But really, it's trying to connect with this other communication, which is a communication to be shared, the ego communication we think is just our own and internal and, and our own personal identity and our own private thing. So then when we get in touch with this other communication, it's to flow between people and species and everything. It's not meant to be kept for oneself. So then when we try to express it and others can't see it, it sort of blocks that communication because it's something to see and act not just reenacting ego thought programs but see and act and say and share and see together but it's not really happening that way and when we do eventually land in a psychiatrist's office or something they're just listening in order to do something to us not see what we're saying so the low power is from not being able to communicate so if we can communicate even just with ourselves, we will build power in our nervous system and then that communication can trickle out without ever thinking, oh, I have to go out and communicate this. It will just happen naturally. And we might think, well, talking to ourselves is kind of silly, but we do that all the time in our head. So if we can actually, instead of having these loops going on in our head, unfold understanding through insights in daily life and give voice to them and make more understanding, then it's a different movement of just keeping it in one's head for oneself. Because that's what we do with our ego, and when that breaks down and we see we really want to see and share, when we're not able to communicate that and see and share with people, then that process breaks down and then we get lost in the ego again. So it's really important to be able to get this feedback, feed forward loop of communication going. And we can do that first with ourselves. Just like when we're training for a race that we might be in with thousands of people. We're first training with ourselves. We're by ourselves. We're lifting weights. We're running. We're doing all these things to train ourselves up for the real thing. The race. So this, in a way, is like training because we've been so trained in all these other ways. And we're entrained by media and TV and everything. And we're not able to powerfully communicate because we're just passively receiving all these communications and just being entrained really and when we're entrained we're subject to that level of consciousness that is entraining us whether it's a tv show or media or even the entrainment of buying into psychiatry on a long-term basis so i feel like just like our body can make any biomolecule on the inside that we can make on the outside to take to create that state like LSD creates expanded consciousness while well, the universe energy can come in and expand our consciousness we don't need to take LSD it's just a way to do that or we can take some kind of molecule to make us happy but the body can also make happy molecules inside and when we keep taking things from the outside our body is less able to make it for itself. So I actually learned by taking melatonin every night, my body was probably stopping making melatonin. So I stopped taking melatonin because then my body will start making it again. So if I'm looking outside to get happy molecules or taking things to be happy, then my body's less able to just make those naturally. And not just make them naturally all the time, but make them on order right in the instant that it's necessary for that so it's about mirroring the moment not just always trying to be happy or whatever but so in the same way we can think to ourselves oh i need to expand my range of acceptable behavior but of course there's also always a universal process that can do that for us so we can think i my ego needs to consciously do this or there's also a process in the universe that does this without our conscious will whatsoever. Most people don't ask to go into so-called mania. It just happens. And then since it happens and we don't consciously, willfully do something, 
we think something must be wrong. But really, it's just the universe can do anything we can do artificially to induce what the universe can do, and the universe can do it a hell of a lot better than we can. But then we come in and try and corrupt and distort the process, and then at the same time make millions of dollars selling the happy molecule that we could make ourselves if we would just understand ourselves and what's going on in this process and other processes, of course. So so-called mania and psychosis even show us that our range of behavior, not even acceptable, remove the acceptable, is vast. It's vastly greater than what we experience now as ourselves. So then when those behaviors that come in that are outside the range of what we consider ourselves, we think something else must be doing it. We must be out of control when really all these programs are what control us from not being expansive. So by releasing that mechanism, we're more expansive. And what happens in a way is we expand into all these wonderful, beautiful, magical behaviors, and then we contract back and then we see our potential for some of the worst possible behaviors. And some people do end up acting some of those things out because it's very confusing to be in that sort of universal attunement process and see the possibility for those behaviors, but not act them out. And that's part of why I talked about how even in the good, it's good to not get too involved in acting all of it out because it's about seeing the possibilities and maybe having an understanding that anything's possible, but waiting for that state to be over before we again sort of reattach with the illusion of free will and then can go about slowly unfolding some of these possibilities. Because if we decide to act in the most beautiful possible state and do something beautiful in a moment, then we might decide to act in the most awful feeling of possibility state and and harm somebody or ourselves. But really, acting in those states where we might harm someone or ourselves is the same as acting in a state where we might do something super beautiful. And I'm not saying any of it's right or wrong. It's just really understanding that we have to be careful acting in states that we're not ready for. It's showing us our range, but it doesn't mean that those are the ones that we will consistently be acting out as. So there's a range of society, and then we go way outside the range on either side of so-called good and bad. But when we come back to the range of society... We still don't want to go to that extreme good or extreme bad. Obviously not the extreme bad, but we can still sort of consciously move outside that range of society and perhaps into a different range that might create a different life for ourselves. So it's almost like designing one's life through one's gestures and also through what one puts in front of oneself. And not just puts, but... When something is in front of us, there's so much that could be made salient. So by unfolding understanding, we'll make what is salient based on our understanding. And if we just understand ourselves as bad and mentally ill and and defective, well, we're going to pick out those bits in our reality all the time. And it'll just be confirming that. When there's a whole range of what we can do and and gesture out as our life. And when we believe that we're defective, we're just going to keep gesturing in defective ways because we have that in our beliefs. And another thing that I've learned and discovered is that by taking all these toxic medications, we're not really seeing the moment properly. So even if we're able to act in a good way, it's still building up some kind of stress because we're not quite seeing the moment in that for example say I'm on medications and I'm in this sort of benign situation and everything seems good and I'm just kind of going about the day and I just sit there and twiddle my thumbs and that's a good day and then if I'm not I might be in the same situation and see somebody that needs help and I might get up and help them or I might speak up against something that I see isn't quite right so 
what I'm saying is the medication blocks some communication. And I just gave those examples. It's not a good or bad or right and wrong thing. It's just we're missing information when we're being numbed out by medications, which could be good for a certain period of time, of course. To have too much information is stressful, but to be able to learn to communicate some of these informations that we receive, they don't get stored in us. They don't build up. But I also feel like when we're on medications, there's still part of us that is seeing these things that we could have said, but we didn't say them or we didn't act or we didn't, whatever. We're just kind of, we've just kind of narrowed our acceptable range of behavior to just sitting in a chair and twiddling our thumbs all day. But part of the body and mind and nervous system and heart knows there's a lot more we could be doing. But we just don't quite know how to communicate that. And by communicate, I don't just mean words. I mean like even the way we sit or even the way we talk. The way we're able to look at people or not. So just to numb out the body so we just can sit and stare at a wall and get through the day. The mind and heart know especially if we've been calibrated to some of these other areas of behavior that are very beautiful and some of the more dynamic and positive elements of the possibility of being human and we're sitting and staring at a wall. That's an extreme example. The mind and heart knows that we're not moving in our possibility and we're just sort of being more in a state of doing nothing to stay safe. And then, you know, if we try to do something, people might interpret us as dangerous. And we're not dangerous. We might be dangerous to the structure of society if we, if we start making meaning and communicating as some of these energies that we're able to perceive. When our ego structure is scrambled, we're able to see a lot more and speak as that, not just speak as our limited ego and memories and blah, blah, blah. There's a much more dynamic way to communicate and we're trying to get in touch with that or something is trying to get in touch with us. It's knocking at the door of our ego and asking it to open the door and let us in and rearrange the furniture and maybe tear down the whole house and build a new one. And... Adam Galinsky said, there's two ways to expand. You seem powerful in your own eyes, which to me is something that can happen in self-dialogue, or you seem powerful in the eyes of others, and they will grant you a wider range. So if we're able to powerfully communicate with others, they will sense us as more powerful. If we're able to powerfully communicate with ourselves as these energies We'll sense ourselves as more powerful. We'll grant ourselves a wider range of behavior. And there's also a question of if we want to be accepted by a society that would just pathologize us. And it's not a matter of fighting that, but just creating something else where we don't have to think about this concept of being accepted. And you talked about the mama bear effect where women get just as good of results as men when advocating for others. So it's interesting how it's okay for women to advocate for others, but they can't advocate for themselves. And that could be seen as negative, but there's an, a little bit there in that women are just probably a little bit more selfless, and we need more of that selfless energy in the world. And And hopefully I can advocate for others by sharing myself at some point. And he said, when we advocate for others, we discover our own voice. And and I definitely am discovering my voice. I don't think I'll ever discover it. It's a matter of always moving and discovering it fresh and anew and not clinging on to any of it. And he also said, perspective taking is one of the most powerful tools we have to expand our range. And to me, that relates to how in map consciousness... Really, that is about infinite perspective taking. We no longer have just the perspective of our limited egocentric consciousness. We become world centric, ethnocentric, and cosmocentric as well. And we can take all these other perspectives, and that's part of the recalibration and reattunement of the human nervous system to operate having a nervous system that is an empathetic mirror of the moment and not just 
a regurgitator of memories and programs and keeping oneself feeling separate and divided from everything. When one doesn't feel separate and divided, one automatically just takes perspective without trying to think, I have to take perspective. So just like I said before, we can think, I need to learn to take perspectives or I'm going to try to take perspectives or we can realize the universe can just make us do that too in map consciousness and with that extra energy which is the power which just expands the ranges of behavior and also the perspective taking at the same time so all these people that make these clever little ways of thinking about moving willfully the universe can do beyond us having any sense of free will or control and when that happens we just have to learn a lot faster so we can do it through the intellect like step one do this step two take perspective step three blah 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 or I don't know what the or is but I know the or for me is just being in that state of map consciousness and it's like accelerated learning of these these ideas that people come up with intellectually through the study of science but the real study of science is having a scrambled ego and being so naked and vulnerable in the moment that one really has to figure it out for oneself moment to moment it's sort of like playing a video game for the first time we've never played it before we have to figure everything out for ourselves moment to moment we still have an idea because we've played other video games you know we are, have a human form we still have an idea about what it means to be human to some extent we can walk move our arms we can do all these things but it's a completely different game and we have to learn moment to moment and just like in the video game if if you lose a life in a video game you just start again so if we get to the ceiling of map consciousness and, and bottom out in so-called psychosis well we can start again it's sort of like getting to the end of the level and having to start again or just losing a life in a game and then starting again and then with video games when we play the level a few times even if we don't make it to the end eventually we do make it to the end and it gets easier each time it's just like being in a new game in the nervous system where we can't rely on all our past programming to inform us, which means we have to be so awake, so alert, so clear. And it's pretty difficult to do that every moment, but as soon as we are again, we're again moving in that field. So it's a matter of an instant of moving in the field of thought and programs to moving in the field of perception, action, understanding, meaning, clarity etc etc so so-called mania or magic is increasing perspective taking and it's a power and energy that increases our range of behavior forget the word accepted accepted implies reward and punishment and really freedom is moving beyond reward and punishment so when one is able to stepwise increase the power in one's own nervous system one eventually is free from even feeling like one's behaviors need to be acceptable according to this reward punishment program just like in mania we don't really care about that until we're eventually punished by psychiatry and then that scares us for sure but we can eventually move into something beyond that and then it's just communication it's just beauty it's just movement it's just life i'm just about to embark on my last rollerblading foray on this really awesome trail that I love and I got my safety helmet gotta fix that got my wrist guards and I also got my bone conduction headphones by Trex Titanium I got them through crowdfunding and I don't use them that often but they're good for being outside if I want to listen to a bit of music I can still hear what's going on around me I would never wear headphones that plug into my ears directly out and about like this. It's not safe. So here I go.
is another milestone day. It's officially six weeks that I've been off medications and I'm feeling better and better every day for sure. I've noticed a lot of changes that I've talked about along the way and one thing that I do every morning when I wake up is check my phone and I think a lot of people probably do that and I had an email notification about tweets of people I follow or something and a lot of them are mental health related and I got one tweet that just seemed to really fire me up and I usually don't get fired up too much but for some reason this one really hit me and probably because also a friend of mine was just released from the hospital yesterday and is totally drugged up and everything and doesn't want to be on medications at all and the tweet was from the BC Schizophrenia Society and the title is more good reasons about why hashtag medication is key in a full mental illness treatment plan smash the stigma and the tweet links to an article on themighty.com called 18 messages for people who view medicating mental illness as a weakness and it's by Sarah Schuster, and it says, Going on medication for any health concern or condition is not a decision to take lightly. Going on medication for mental illness, however, is a decision often muddled with stigma and guilt. For those who think they can push through the symptoms of mental illness, taking medication might feel like giving in. And then it goes on to say, "It doesn't. Medication certainly doesn't have to be a part of everyone's mental illness recovery, but making an important decision like how to best manage your mental illness Shame and stigma shouldn't be a factor. So something I'd like to say about the first paragraph is making the decision to go on medication is often blah 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 stigma and guilt. I feel most people who get labeled with something like schizophrenia or bipolar don't make the decision. They're just forcibly medicated. So this is more about making decision to stay on the medication because Oftentimes, I don't know what the percentage of people would be, but it's not like we walk into a doctor's office and say, I'm seeing things, can you help me make a decision about going on medication? No, it's usually being hauled into a psych ward and forcibly given pills, and if we're not willing to take them, we're forcibly injected. So this makes it sound all like rosy and stuff, and that was not my experience. I was put on them forcibly against my will. And then, medication doesn't certainly need to be a part of everyone's mental illness recovery. It makes it sound so, it makes it sound like it's a decision that we actually make. It's not really, we're just sort of put on them. And it says, shame and stigma shouldn't be a factor. It's acting like that's the biggest factor, when the biggest factor is the side effects. And the side effects aren't just like, oh, my nose is a bit runny, it's massive weight gain, total dullness, total flatness, um, sometimes feeling like one wants to kill oneself actually gets way worse, not better. I've experienced akesthesia on two occasions where I basically feel like I'm just gonna run and kill myself and I don't even want to, it's beyond my control. And it's not a fun thing. So they just act like shame and stigma are the biggest things. Most people don't decide or not decide based on shame and stigma. It's they get put on it forcibly in the case of, say, schizophrenia and bipolar. And then it's the side effects, not shame and stigma, that makes us want to quit them. If it actually didn't have side effects and made us just feel better, I don't think we would give a shit about shame and stigma. We would just feel better, but it's not that simple. And then they say, to better understand the issue, we asked our mighty readers what they would say to someone who's hesitant to take medication for mental health. Keep in mind the below is based on each person's personal experience. If you are considered going on or off a medication, please consult a professional. And then they give all these wonderful little metaphors from people with experience which it's easy to find 18 people who can give wonderful little sound bites, and I have nothing against that. 
I actually feel like there is a time and a place for medication and I could never say myself that medications are completely bad because I was on medication for six years and and a lot of it was just fine really and it's not for me it's more being put on certain ones that I know don't work for me at all and then the doctor just has the power in the psych ward to just do it anyways and then it is a disaster that nearly kills me and that scares me away from that for sure and also there is a time and a place I was on it for six years what bothers me too is it's mostly presented as a one-way ticket when I was put on the medications the very first day I talked to a doctor they said you will likely have to be on these the rest of your life and I don't even know if they said likely they might have said probably but it was sort of like a tone saying you pretty much have to take these forever and to be told that on day one that's the most unhopeful thing ever and I don't feel like anyone should ever be told that I don't think it should be a one-way ticket there should be lots and lots of return trips to not having this stuff go through one system if that's what one wants. So I'll read some of the metaphors. Having a mental illness is like walking through knee-deep snow. You can get where you're going with enough effort, but it's slow going and exhausting. Medication is like wearing snowshoes. It alone won't get you where you're going, but at least it will put you on top of the snow where you can walk with much more ease. And there might be an element of truth to that, but at the same time, when it's presented as you're always going to have to wear medication snowshoes for the rest of your life, even if no one else is wearing these snowshoes and you look different and gain weight and are hard, and it's even harder to function. I can't talk right now. I just, ugh. it's a scary decision, a big decision, a decision I'm glad I made for myself and my son. We're different people now, thanks to medication. For us, it was worth the risk. So there are elements and truth in here. It's a huge risk to take medication for sure. Medicine is there to help you, and they put help in italic letters. The stigma against it may be scary, but you deserve all the help you can get. Don't be afraid to accept help. And I don't feel we're afraid to accept help. It's just, if that's the only form of help, that's very sad and limited. If you wouldn't hesitate to take medication for a heart condition or an infection, why would you hesitate to take medication for mental illness? You don't have to suffer, so why should you? This is all just very, very, I don't know. Depending on your specific mental health issue, medication can mean the difference between life and death, day and night, rest and no rest. Well, it can also mean the difference between life and death in that some medications make us actually end our lives and it actually makes it so life is very dull I wouldn't be alive today without meds the first time I started antidepressants it took about four weeks but I woke up one day and it was like the Sun had risen in my mind after years of night I could make decisions advocate for myself and I was still in every way me now this provides a clue to these quotes here are more about people who consciously walked into a doctor's office and decided to take antidepressants and there's nothing wrong with that that's perfectly fine but they're not covering how how most people who have a bipolar disorder diagnosis don't have that free will to choose medication can level the playing field so you can get in the game of life then therapy gives you the tools to play now this provides another lovely clue Maybe we don't want to play the game of life as it's structured. Maybe it's very mechanical. Maybe we've been educated to think that's what life is. And then this creative energy comes in and shows us something different. And it reacquaints us with what the energy was like to be a child. And as children, we have this creative energy and it gets conditioned out of us very slowly over time. So we don't even really notice. It's like a frog slowly being boiled in water. They don't jump out because they don't notice. So then when we get reacquainted with this creative energy, at least in bipolar, we feel alive again. We feel free. We feel like adult children. So then when that energy starts to dissipate, 
and we're getting pulled again into the structures of society, we know what we're losing. And of course we go kicking and screaming sometimes. If children knew what we were doing to them, they would kick and scream. And some of them are born doing that now. And another thing, therapy gives you the tools to play. Well, in the country I'm from, medications are often provided by government funding and health care and stuff, but there's no therapy provided. If one wants therapy, one has to pay out of one's own pocket, at least talk therapy. There's like rec therapy and different forms of therapy for sure, but it's very contrived in what is allowed. It's not self-directed. And then this one says, I was on medication after medication, one after another, for many years. But I've been medication-free for about 10 years now. But what do they have to lose by giving the medication a chance? Whether you choose to take medication or be medication-free, without saying yes the first time, it's hard to make an informed decision. And another point to that is, we aren't allowed to make informed decisions. A lot of times it's just forced decision. It's enforced decision, not informed decision. Even right now, I've been off medication for six weeks and I'm afraid to tell people because all their fears will come in and be projected on me. The worst side effects you might experience or the most hate-filled judgment you might be subjected to could be nothing compared to feeling helpless, hopeless, and tortured for the rest of your life, or even worse, losing your life before it's time. While the worst side effect of medication is losing your life before it's time, many people die because medication side effect is suicide. You don't break an ankle and keep walking on it. You use a crutch so it can heal. Medicine can be a crutch until you're strong enough to heal on your own. And that sounds wonderful. It makes it sound like, oh, you just need it until you can heal on your own. But it's not often presented that way, at least with things like bipolar and schizophrenia. It's, you need to take these for the rest of your life, not, oh, this will be a temporary crutch until you get to a place where you can heal. And medication is a crutch. It's a crutch for ego functioning. But the creative energy in bipolar and schizophrenia, so-called labels, is trying to break apart the egos. So it can be a crutch to function but we still need to move towards this creative energy and there's so much more I could say about this but I just wanted to talk about it because it kind of bothered me and like I said I'm not against medication I was on it for many years but I feel like if one broke an ankle and used a crutch and then when the ankle was healed one continued to use the crutch or use the crutch and just kick the ankle around so it never actually healed, then one is actually going to have a warped structure over time. One is going to be lopsided and one side of the body is going to be stronger than the other and it's going to contort everything. So in the same way, using the medication crutch long term isn't good. It's only a crutch. It's not a solution. And I feel like I got to a point where the crutch was definitely an, an impediment. So I decided to slowly remove the crutch. And now I'm in that place where I don't have the crutch at all. And I feel a lot better. I feel stronger. How would my whole body get strong if I continued to use a crutch for the rest of my life? It's not going to. So being able to walk and be in the world without the medication crutch is actually going to make me stronger because it's not toxifying my nervous system and dulling me out to things that I need to be seeing and and acting on. So it's a very delicate dance and I could never say, oh, I would have been completely fine if I never took medication. I wouldn't take that back. What I take back what I'm not cool with is the whole thought that, oh, this gets worse over time, you need more meds over time, you need med changes over time. I think being on meds temporarily can buy oneself time to sort of be able to walk in both worlds. 
the world of ego functioning and the world of healing and then moving towards creativity and those traits and factors that arise when one gets connected with omnipolar consciousness with trans consciousness with map consciousness which is learning from the moment like we did as children and so we can do that but still have that medication crutch but when we learn enough it actually just becomes detrimental and I think that's the point when there starts and I think one of the clues to that is when one starts to have relapses it's like okay well you've had this crutch long enough the body doesn't like this anymore It would be like using a crutch for so long and then realizing, wow, I've weakened my body so much because I'm using this crutch. So I need to get rid of the crutch so I can be strong. But that's a very delicate process. And the thing that I don't agree with is not having 10 different ways that one can be supported to remove the crutch if they don't want it anymore. Or if they want to try walking without the crutch. And even if it doesn't work, that should be one's own decision. And even if it doesn't work and then one goes back on medications for two to five years and they want to try again, that should be their own decision. It's, and not only that, it should be supported. A lot of people don't successfully remove the crutch because there's not all these supports to help one get off the crutch. There's a million ways to get on them, get on the meds, and there's like zero ways out so I just don't like the one-way street, that's all. I'm not against them at all. I think it's necessary according to where we are in consciousness as a humanity. And I have a lot more to say, but today I'm driving down to a different part of California for two hours to return the electric car to my friend. And so I might actually talk to myself on audio on the way down. I could spend the time singing and and just enjoying, but I feel like I just want to speak about stuff, so I probably will.